Hello guys, Europe from Sharp 11 Music here. This time I'm doing a video I've long been waiting to make since it came out and I was really excited about that. There is an actual Paul Desmond mouthpiece made by Morgan Mouthpiece. It's released about a year ago and now finally I can say I have tested it and I have quite some thoughts to share with you on that front. I've been doing a lot of Paul Desmond content on this channel in terms of transcriptions. There are 20 plus transcriptions so far and there will be coming many more still. And also about a year ago, I started doing reviews on mouthpieces and that came out of actually trying to see if I could find something that would really help me get towards that Paul Desmond sound. For those of you who don't know, Paul Desmond used to play a MC Gregory mouthpiece, model A for A, a theme, that's a mouthful. And that brand is long out of running since the 80s, I think. So they're not really on the market anymore. You could maybe find somewhere a second hand on eBay or something, but it's quite hard to find. So we really don't know what the experience of Paul Desmond would have been uh, while playing his saxophone. But luckily for us, Morgan Mouthpieces company acquired some of the original molds and cores that uh, were used to make these MC Gregory mouthpieces and their mouthpiece maker Eric Greifenhagen and I hope I pronounced that correctly uh, has spent decades looking into these kind of designs. So Eric used all that knowledge and the original cores and molds to produce a new Paul Desmond mouthpiece which is called the Dry Martini as Paul Desmond once called his own sound in an interview, which we all know is such a spot on kind of analogy for his sound. Let's first take a little listen to how it actually sounds next to Paul Desmond on one of his solos that I really admire. I try to copy it as well as I can and let's see what you think and then let's discuss the mouthpiece. Okay, so my experience was that it was really, really nice and really comfortable to get in that realm of Paul Desmond sound. The mouthpiece I am playing is the same opening as Desmond used to play, which is actually a tip opening, don't be surprised, but a tip opening for. <laughs> That's correct. That's really such a small opening. Also for me, uh, because I'm used to a eighth tip opening when I play on what is now my regular mouthpiece, which is a retro revival Eric Marienthal model. Uh, some of you might have seen me play and with my own band, which actually couldn't be Further from Desmond's approach, it's a fusion band with a bright sound, with a bright setup. That's usually my setup with a tip opening 8. So this is almost day and night difference from uh, what I'm used to play. So needless to say, when the mouthpiece arrived, I needed quite a few times first just to get used to the tip opening. Um, but once you get used to it, uh, you produce a better sound with these smaller tip openings if you don't try to sound as big and broad as, as most jazz musicians would try to do. You really need to play more introverted, which Paul Desmond obviously was, 
when I started doing that, then it really starts sounding superb. I, I'm really loving it. Every next time I play it, I get more into what is needed for the mouthpiece to work. And it's so great, I think. I think I came pretty close to kind of the sound matching, to the core of the sound, and more specifically the sound timbre. Because there is way more to a, when we talk about a saxophone sound, it's not only the timbre, usually in jazz, it's also the expression and the articulation, which is often hugely underestimated. I mean, I think it might be even more distinct how certain players scoop their notes or uh, attack or have a soft attack on the on the notes or the kind of vibrato and where they put it than the actual timbre of of the sound but that's for a different video what i want to talk about are some of the basic aspects when it comes to checking if it's a good mouthpiece the first one and if it doesn't pass this test, you actually should never go on, is intonation, of course. And the thing is that it took me a long time just to realize that I didn't have any issues with um, intonation. Intonation is also usually more of a problem with the brighter mouthpieces where they kind of start fooling around with the the shapes and the baffles in the mouthpiece which give a different and brighter sound color but also messes quite some with uh with the intonation which is in this case obviously not the goal of the mouthpiece it's also smaller i think this might help with the fact that it's really super nicely controllable in uh intonation so that's great the second parameter for me is does it have a even kind of sound throughout the range or perhaps are some notes more muffled and others way more open and how much of difference is there. And also there it's incredibly even. Some of the notes that I kind of don't like so much uh, when, I'm, when I'm playing on my brighter mouthpieces are the middle D and the middle E, especially the middle D can sound incredibly stuffy and not so great. Let me just play for you just through the range of the horn. <laughs> It's, it's easy, it's super even, nothing jumps out or holds back really. And this is the only mouthpiece I kind of start liking the, the middle D and the E actually. Which is best tested actually around this note with one of Paul Desmond's tunes called Wendy. So maybe let's have a listen to that as an example. And now you will hear me playing with a backing track uh, just without Desmond. That's only me and the mouthpiece here. Another important parameter is what's the comfort of playing this mouthpiece, which is really important and which is not necessarily that you want it to be super easy only, uh, because it can be at times a bit too easy, too less resistance, which sometimes can cause, I've had this before with, I'll not mention the mouthpiece, but 
really years back I was playing such an incredible comfortable mouthpiece in, in that it lacked a lot of resistance. It almost played from here when I would blow through the mouthpiece and then I just didn't put enough effort into having a grounded sound. It sounded just a bit sloppy, it was too easy so to speak and, and that's also how my sound came true actually, it, it sounded a bit lazy. And you don't want it to be too harsh backing up on you either, it doesn't have to feel like a fight. But this mouthpiece I feel is really down the middle, it's, it provides me really the 50-50, the enough resistance to get also this darkness and this dryness in this sound, while still having a incredible comfortable experience at the same time. So this really um, feels great, uh, it plays great even and intonates really nicely, so that's those three things that we need to answer a fourth really important question. Where can I actually use this mouthpiece for? The only disadvantage I would be able to think of for this mouthpiece is the circumstance. It's a beautiful sounding mouthpiece with great comfort, but I can imagine that if I would go out and would head to a jam session, I would kind of drone in most circumstances because as you might know in the regular jam sessions or jazz combo settings it's just usually pretty loud and this mouthpiece uh, sounds really soft and sounds the best when played uh, on a mezzo forte or, or a piano way of approach. So for example also big bands this will be really hard to deal with. But also there I should leave some leeway here because I'm playing the opening four, that's the real Desmond opening, but they come at Morgan in opening four, five and six. So perhaps if you would have to play in medium loud circumstances, let's say a jazz quartet, quintet, uh, playing more into bebop or hard bop, I would if I were you, just try the 5 or the 6 opening, that probably will give you a little bit more headroom in terms of volume. This brings me to a important, I think, disclaimer, just how I would describe this mouthpiece. It's a really nice bridge between jazz and classical. That's also probably how you would think of Paul Desmond, his playing. He has a lot of classical approaches towards sound, but also towards improvisation. But again, that's for, for another time super interesting. He uses almost classical composition techniques to build his solos. So there he really touches on, on classical music. He quotes classical music and he sounds probably also more uh, towards a classical saxophone sound, but still with a lot of jazz in it. So it's a perfect bridge mouthpiece between classical and jazz. If you've played uh, jazz mouthpieces this does feel different but in a good way because it shapes your sound way more to a soft sound, way more to, to the core of its sound instead of what I usually think of most jazz mouthpieces is that it's to make it uh, compete with a in a live setting with drums with a loud drummer usually and it's a little bit of a uh, focused bloated sound which goes really forward this sound really stays more introverted but is totally beautiful if you don't need to compete with with the rest of the band so that being said although I've been playing on bright mouthpieces I've decided to do at least for a year perhaps more a kind of retreat on saxophone and focus more on Paul Desmond and studying his way of improvisation and his sound uh, more and I will be using this mouthpiece. I'm really happy to have uh, found this. So subscribe for that if you haven't yet and I'll be starting a Paul Desmond tribute band as well uh, in 2000. 
23. Oh, on that front, I'm also thinking of a new project, very much like the Charlie Parker Cherokee Super Sax project, for those who have seen that. Which of Paul Desmond's solos would you like to see harmonized for a saxophone section? Uh, drop that in the comments, and of course, let me know what you think about this mouthpiece. Are you going to try this one? And how do you think it sounds from yeah, what I'm providing? Now, I really would love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm really excited for what's about to come. I've been Jori Reiners from Sharp 11 Music and I hope to see you soon again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.